But if we love Jesus, can we make some noise for Jesus in this place, man? Man, what a joy and an honor to be in God's house this morning. Can I just tell you, church, there is something special that God is doing here at LifeBridge. I truly believe that the hand of God is on the people of God as we're preparing for the move of God. Amen. And, uh, and it is it's happening here, so I'm just telling you, you want to hold on, buckle up, because I believe the best is yet to come. Now, I also have to say that, you know, LifeBridge has become very special to me, and that was really solidified this morning. I walked in, and there was uh, this beautiful, beautiful basket put together for me. And I'm a simple kind of guy, church. You know, uh, for me, as a person who's involved in a lot, and I'm not that organized, and so to, to focus myself, I have to use things like colored pens and, and highlighters. And so in the bag uh, for me today, uh, there was these colored pens. And can I just tell you, my heart was overjoyed um, because two things I love, well, a couple things I love. Number one, Jesus. Uh, number two, my wife and my family. Uh, number three, a tall a hot caramel macchiato with oat milk, no foam, sugar-free vanilla, upside down. Um, but then also color pens and highlighters. This, my friend, and V8, they also have V8s in there, V8 energy uh, drinks. Listen, can I just throw up the hearts right now? Um, I don't know if you're watching online, if you can feel the love too, but yes, I love Life Bridge, all right? And so, man... And I, I just, I love, love, love uh, Pastor Luke and just his heart, and I'm so grateful. And, and I'm just, you know, I got to say this because I do agree with him that you do give honor where honor is due. And, and unfortunately, this is a, it's a great thing that we have in Pastor Luke, but it's a sad thing for the global church. But unfortunately, we live in a world where there are not many guys uh, that live what they preach on the stage, in their lives, out, out, off the stage, and outside of the church. And Pastor Luke is one that what he speaks and he preaches, he lives outside of the four walls of this building. So can we just honor the man of God in this place, man? Grateful for you, and I love you. Now, for me, my job this morning is to give you not my opinion because it doesn't matter, uh, not what's trending because trends and fast, they're here today and they're gone tomorrow. But to this morning, we're going to dive into what I believe is the only thing that is life-giving, transformational, and that will change the trajectory of our lives forever, and that's God's Word and God's Word alone. Amen? And, and these last few weeks, we have been in this series. Pastor Luke has been teaching us about the importance of how to handle anxiety how to navigate the minefields of anxiety. And I encourage you, if you've not had an opportunity to hear all of the messages that have been preached the last couple of weeks on anxiety, I would encourage you to go back because there's so many golden nuggets. There's so many, there's so many great principles, rules, and tools that Pastor Luke shared that were so important on how to navigate the, the anxieties that we all feel, the angst and the, the anxieties, the depression and the insecurities that we're all feeling. Because I don't know about you, but it doesn't matter about how many degrees you got or how many zeros are in your paycheck. We all are flawed individuals, amen. And we all, if we're honest, have moments of weaknesses and anxieties that sometimes it can overtake us in such a way that we begin to get caught in this vacuum of just feeling like, man, I'm overwhelmed. I don't know what to do or how to do it or, or who to turn to. And, and, and the anxiety and the depression, it overtakes us in such a way that we're just feeling lost. And so I'm grateful for the last couple of weeks. And so this morning, I really just kind of want to put it all together with a phrase. If our topic today is just a phrase that simply says this, church, Jesus is enough. That's it. That's the topic. I know it's like, hey, you, you almost missed a flight from Columbia. Well, actually, my flight did get canceled from Columbia, South Carolina. And, um, and so, and it's Delta, by the way. I love Delta. And so, um, and so, but I know you're thinking, man, you came all the way here just to say that simple phrase, Jesus is enough. And the answer is yes, because I believe that he is. And if you are a note taker, I love taking notes. If you're a note taker, I got four points and two equations I want to give you. All right. 
But I'll give you the two equations first and then the four points. But the two equations with, that really I believe helps um, communicate this phrase, Jesus is enough. The first uh, equation, if, you're, if you want to take notes and write this down and put it in your Bible or bookmark it or something, is simply this equation. Everything minus Jesus equals nothing. Everything minus Jesus equals nothing, meaning you can have a lot of status and stuff. You can have a lot of education. You can have a lot of financial resources. You can have a lot of things that are temporal, temporary on this side of heaven. But if you don't have Jesus in your life, can I tell you, you really have nothing. Because all of these temporal, temporary things that you have, that you've gained, they are here today and they're gone tomorrow. But the only thing that will last in our lives, the only thing that will give us a peace that surpasses all understanding, the only thing that is sustainable and transferable and will change the trajectory of our lives forever is Jesus and Jesus alone. So everything minus Jesus equals nothing. Here is the second equation. Nothing plus Jesus equals everything. Nothing plus Jesus equals everything. So if, if, if I don't have anything right now, if I feel like I'm, I'm a person, who I, you say, Jeff, right now in this moment, I'm broke, busted, and disgusted. But I'm saying, but even with all the things that I don't have, I'm going to hold on to the truth that's found in God's word, and I'm going to connect myself to Jesus, uh, then I know it's at this moment that I have everything. And when we understand these, this truth, that nothing plus Jesus equals everything, then it helps us navigate those moments where we have angst and anxieties and, and there's ambiguity and uncertainty in our lives. And so uh, I want to take a look today, church, at a very familiar passage of Scripture. There's a story that's in John chapter 11. Um, there's a story where Jesus really helps remind a family that's actually close to him of one, his deity, two, of uh, the fact that he is enough, and, and three, he takes them on a journey not just to prove that to, to this family, but also to prove to others around that are watching. And it's a story of a man named Lazarus and his sister Mary and Martha. And so let's take a look at six little verses here. Um, we're going to start off with six verses in chapter 11 of uh, the book of John. Uh, John chapter 11, verse 1 through 6, the Bible says this. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, uh, was, uh, whose brother now lay sick, was the same one who had poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the, the sisters, they sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he, meaning Jesus, had heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus, he loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. Now, interestingly enough, as we know, just a little Bible study here, obviously just simple Bible study, uh, the book of John is the fourth book and the final book of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're the Gospels. And so John is at the end here. And, and the book of John, what I love about the book of John is it really provides a lot of treasures uh, within there and golden nuggets. And there's a lot of stories and teaching uh, on Jesus that you won't find in any of the other Gospels. There are a lot of stories in the Gospels that kind of repeat themselves. So you'll see one in Luke, and then you'll see that same or similar story in in. John, I mean, and, um, and uh, Mark, but, but you don't really see it in John because John is just a very unique book. It's also, in my humble opinion, and many scholars will agree that John is probably the simplest book of the gospel out of all the gospels, but it's also the most profound book. It is a book that really helps us have um, some, get some tools and nuggets on what it means to be an evangelist. Right, and also what it means to understand the essence of who Jesus is. 
Now, Jesus, he proclaims this truth about himself in John 11 and 25. If you continue on reading in John 11 and 25, he just says, hey, I am the resurrection and the life. He says in, in John 8 and 12, he says, hey, I am the light of the world. And, and so he makes these declarations about himself in John chapter 11 when he says, I'm the resurrection. He makes a declaration about himself in John chapter 8 when he says, I am uh, the light of the world. But, but, but Jesus in this particular story that, that we're going to look at this morning. Jesus, he uses this moment with Lazarus in his death, because spoiler alert, you hear in the six verses, they send word that he's sick, but sorry people, he actually dies. But Jesus, he uses this moment to really kind of let people know that I am truly the Messiah. Because what has been happening up until this point, as we read through the Gospels, what's been happening is people, they're not really feeling Jesus. Like, there's a lot of people who are rejecting Jesus because Jesus, he's making this claim that he is truly the Son of God. And many of the people during this time, they actually, they viewed Jesus as just a simple rabbi. And they thought that he was a rabbi who was really kind of feeling himself. They thought that he was a rabbi who was saying some things that were kind of blasphemous. And so, so Jesus, he uses this moment like other stories that you'll read in the gospel, but he uses this moment moment to let people know the naysayers, the gossipers, and those who are not sure that he's truly the Messiah. He uses this moment to share with everybody that I am truly the resurrection and the life. I am truly, uh, I'm the resurrection and the life, excuse me. And he says, I am truly the light of the world. And so this story, this story is, is a very unique story because it helps us understand all that Jesus is going through. Now, as Jesus is being rejected, he's being rejected by so many people throughout, uh, we read the four Gospels, but there was one family, there was one family that never really rejected Jesus. And that family was Lazarus, his sister Mary, and Martha. So Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, these siblings, they weren't a family that actually rejected Jesus. They were a family that had built some relational equity with Lazarus. And because of the relational equity that they built with Jesus, uh, when, whenever Jesus was in and around Jerusalem, then Jesus would come and stay and hang out with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And, and, and Jesus, Jesus, in this moment in the story, Jesus is only about two miles away. So just think about him. Where When Jesus gets word about Lazarus who is sick, he's, it's like he's at the target up the street, right? From here to target is about where, the distance between Jerusalem and Bethany. It's like two miles. So, so Jesus, at this moment, he's on this, like, evangelism tour. He's out. He's, you know, he's raised, uh, he's healing the sick. He's bringing sight to the blind. You know, he's casting out demons. He, in Mark chapter 2, he, he takes a paralyzed man, and, and he uh, heals him after the four men drop him down, you know, in front of uh, Jesus while he's in the house preaching. Like, he's kind of like on this evangelism tour. And Mary and Martha, they know that Jesus is busy, on this evangelism tour, he's healing people like, hey, got sight now. He blind? He got sight, right? You know what I'm saying? You're sick? Oh, you're healed. Oh, you're hungry? You got just two uh, fish, five loaves of bread? Hey, let me feed the multitude. Mary and Martha, they know Jesus is busy, but because of the relational equity that they had with him, they felt like it was appropriate to still send a message to him that, hey, Lazarus, that's why the Bible says the one you love is sick. And we know where you are, Jesus. We know that you're not too far from us. So surely you can kind of take a pause from healing other people and come and heal the one that is sick. Does that make sense? So, so this is just kind of a backstory of, of what's happening here in the story. But what Mary and Martha anticipated Jesus' response to be Jesus, he did not respond that way. And can I suggest to many of us in this house this morning that a lot of times we come into God's house and we expect God to respond a certain way because we want him to respond the way we think we, that he should respond. But we need to understand that his ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. And so the way he may respond is not the way we think he should. But can I just suggest to everyone in here, a hundred percent of the time, his response is better than the response we want. 
So there's four things, there's four things, friends, that I believe that this story really shows us this morning about understanding this truth that Jesus is truly enough. And so what are those four things that we know based on what we've just read, not just in these six verses, but we'll continue to look at the whole story. Number one, if you're taking notes, the first thing that we know about Jesus in moments like this is number one, he's never surprised. Jesus is never surprised. Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. He is never caught off guard. And, and so we see here in verse 4 and 6, uh, when Jesus had heard that Lazarus was sick, the messenger, there was a sense of urgency that the messenger had. It's almost as if, you know, um, the messenger knew that Jesus needed to get to Lazarus quick because death was upon him. So the messenger comes and says, Jesus your homie, your boy, your partner, your BFF, the one that you sip coffee with on a regular with him and his sisters, he's sick. You need to get to him. And Jesus, in a very calm and chilled uh, response, he's like, this sickness is not going to end in death. He's like, no, it is for God's glory so that God's son will be glorified. And then the Bible goes on and says that, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So because he loved her, you know what he did? He waited two more days. Why? Because Jesus knew what tomorrow looked like before he stepped into it. And when we think about this truth, when we talk about dealing with our anxiety, the reason why it's important to put all of our fears, our anxieties, and everything that we're dealing with at the feet of the cross is because we serve a God who is never surprised by our, our requests or our needs. We serve a God who's never surprised about our issues and the things that we go through. So when, he take, when we take it to him, he's not, oh my, I didn't know that that's what you were dealing with. That's not his response. He's like, hey, I, I was just really waiting for you to give me an opportunity to show you who I am. If you don't believe me, let me let's, 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 let's talk a little bit about the essence of what it means to be God in the flesh. Jesus, the Messiah, God in the flesh. He, he, is, he is truly God walking amongst us. And, and there is a word, a theology word, that um, is simply omni. Omni is O-M-N-I-S, omni. And that is, that, that, that word omni just means all. And when we, when we think about this word omni, we think about the essence of, of who Jesus is in this moment as, 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 as God in the flesh. He's, he's an all-knowing, all-loving, all-powerful God. He's omniscient. He's omnipotent. You know what I'm saying? He's all-powerful. That omnipotent means he's omnipotent. He's, he's, he has all power in his hand, and he's also all-knowing. So when the messenger came to Jesus, Jesus wasn't surprised because he is the all-knowing God. And so when you come to Jesus with your issues, he already, he already knew what you were about to say. It's like me. I love, I love as a parent of four, and this is, this is just, it's a, it's a good thing for, for children to understand this about most parents. A lot of times, we already know what you're about to ask before you ask it. And I was the type of parent, I would always tell my kids, hey, listen, I would much rather get an ugly truth than a beautiful lie. And so, I'll, you know, a lot of times, especially my middle son, CJ, he was the one that would stretch my faith the most, right? <laughs> he was the one, I mean, like, for real, like, he would always just kind of go to the, to the edge of the cliff and just, like, just tip his, just dip his toe, you know, in the pool of sin, you know, and danger. And so, a lot of times, for me, I would always know what's going on. And so, and I even would tip my hand to my children. I was like, hey, you know, I am the all-knowing father. No. And so, but, but I would tip my hand. I was like, hey, listen, a lot of times I ask you questions, and I already know the answer. I just want to see if you're going to tell me the truth. And so I would tell my kids that, but CJ, for some reason, he would, man, he just wouldn't, he just didn't believe me. And so a lot of times I would ask him questions. I was like, hey, CJ, so, you know, especially, he, he'll never forget this one moment I had a, uh, interaction with, or he had an interaction with his uh, German teacher. I'll never forget this. He had AP German, which I told him, hey, that's crazy within itself. Take Spanish. And so, um, <laughs> so, 
So he has this interaction with his German teacher. His German teacher sends uh, me and my wife an email. It's like, hey, CJ's been a little bit disrespectful, whatever, whatever. I told him that I was going to reach out to you. And he said to, to me, reach out to them then, right? And so, so I was like, okay. And I'll never forget this. I was in a staff meeting at my church back home. And, and where we live, we were on the north side of town. We live uh, in an area called Johns Creek, and, and, uh, and our church was in Decatur. So it, it would take about 45 minutes to get to the church. And I mean, to so the school, excuse me, from the church. And so my wife, she couldn't get off. And so she gave me the little word. She said, hey, read this email from, you know, CJ's teacher. Got it. I replied back to her. Um, I said, Miss Edwards. And then I said, don't worry about it. I'm on it. And so... I asked my pastor, I said, hey, pastor, I need to take my lunch break early. And, uh, and then I said, and I also need to know if um, our benevolence uh, committee pays bail money, because I might go to jail. <laughs> and so, um, and so, so I get there, and I, I true story, I, I go and I try to check him out because, you know, um, I, I was planning on having a conversation with him by laying holy hands on him. And, um, and so, so I check him out. And I asked the question, he was like, hey, what? He, this is what got me, guys. He comes around the corner, he sees me, because, you know, they call him out. He comes around the corner, he just bebopping. Now, he should have thought, like, God, it's kind of odd that my father is here in the middle of the day. I just had an interaction with my German teacher. Why is my dad here? I mean, you know, it doesn't make it. No, 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 not my boy. He comes bebopping around, he's dapping up friends. Hey, what up? Because he's super popular. And like, what up, bro? And then he comes and he sees me, he's like, oh, what up, Pops? And he daps me up. <laughs> and I was like, wait. So now I'm boiling, right? And, um, and so I'm like, hey, what's up, man? I said, so, you know, tell me, anything happened in class today? That's the clue. And he's like, no, nah, everything's been all good. <laughs> I'm going to ask you again, son. Anything happened in class today, you know? Wow, oh, man, I mean, let's see. He's like, man, oh, I killed my math test. And I was like, anything else? He said, no, nah, no, nah, everything's good. He said, why you ask? Man, I'm just going to, at the risk of not being judged in here, uh, I won't say what I said in response. Just say, in that moment, I wasn't Pastor Jeff. I was just Jeff, right? <laughs> and, uh, and so... So we have this interaction. I'm like, dude, you think I would just come casually up here, take time off of work, drive almost an hour to get here just to see how things are going? I told him, I said, I don't love you that much. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and and so, so I said, and I told him, I said, man, I always ask questions that I have the answer to for the most part. You know, and I said, so if I'm here, you should be thinking, hmm, why is my father here, right? And, and because, because, and then understand, if you tell me, I'm not going to be surprised, like, oh, my gosh, I can't. Obviously, I knew before I asked while I was here, you know, I mean, when I came here, I knew why I was here. And so, so we have to understand in the same vein, but even in a greater sense, that when we bring a petition to our Savior, Jesus, He's never surprised by what's happening because he is the all-knowing, all-powerful, all-loving God. So what are you dealing with? What are you needing right now? To these sisters, these sisters, they knew that their first and last response and resort needed to be that they needed to go to Jesus, the one who could heal this moment. And at this moment, Jesus was not caught off guard. He was fully aware of what was going on with Lazarus, but he was there because he was trying to get the, the greater good to be reminded, hey, I am truly the Messiah. And he says, this sickness will not end in death. And here is the thing, here's the thing, friends. When Jesus tells us something, when we hear a word from God, we need to trust it. We trust news media, Twitter, Instagram, and blogs more than we trust the gospel. Here, the answer that we need for everything is found in the good news gospel of Jesus Christ. Why are we questioning it? If, if, if God said so, you could take it to the bank. 
If God said you will be healed, you will be whole, you will be delivered, this sickness will not end the way you think it will end. You need to just trust God in the process. Why? Because he's a God who's never, never caught off guard. He's never surprised. But then number two, we know not just that Jesus is never late, but we also know number two that, I mean, excuse me, Jesus is never surprised. I just gave you number two. Number two, Jesus is never late. He's never late. He's never late. On his arrival, on his arrival, um, um, verse 17, if you continue to read past uh, verse 6, verse 17 to 20 says this. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus was already had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Mary and Martha to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed home. I, you know what? When I read this, and please, when I say this, please know this is, don't, don't take it wrong. I thought it was, I thought it was like a, a, a black woman because... What Mary says, she says, Lord, had you been here, right, our son had not. I thought about my wife, right? And um, because Lazarus is dead, he's dead, and, and it was so crazy that Mary, the one sister, she heard that Jesus was there, and she was like, I don't even want to see you, Jesus. You know what I'm saying? And then Martha was like, oh, I want to see Jesus, right? And so she was like, because I got something to say to you, Jesus. You know, and I could just, I could just picture, just from where I come from, I could just picture, you know, because my wife has done this to me, Jeffrey, you know, and, uh, and so... So I could just picture Martha, she is angry and frustrated because she believes that Jesus is late. In this moment, what's happened? The, 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 the Lazarus has been in a tomb for four days, and, 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 and now they're mourning, Mary and Martha, they're mourning the death of Lazarus. People are bringing the casseroles and the sweet potato pie and the sweet tea. They're having these moments when they're comforting him, and Jesus just kind of bebops on the scene and be like, what up? But I want you to notice, you never, family, you never read the Bible fast. You got to always read it slow. The Bible says in the beginning, he says, hey, uh, on Jesus' arrival, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. That's significant. Because we need to understand that Jesus' timing is different from our timing. Because what ancient rabbis believed during that time is that when people died, when they, when they died or they, they, they um, uh, were in the tomb, they believed that for a moment, for approximately about three days, what would happen is the spirit would separate from the body and just hover over the body in the tomb for about three days. And so there was a possibility that within the first to the third days that ancient rabbis believed that there was a possibility that there could be a resurrection of what that of the person who was dead. But once you got to the fourth day, rabbis believed that it was in that moment you were dead, dead. Like, you know, you were kind of dead for one to three days, but on the fourth day, you were dead, dead. So Jesus, he's not late. He showed up on the fourth day on purpose because he's saying, hey, listen, spoiler alert, I'm about to drop the mic, resurrect the brother, he's going to come forth. But I want, when I do it, I don't want you to think that I'm some normal rabbi who came in the moment when, when Lazarus' spirit was just hovering over, and so I just kind of jumped in the park and was like, hey, this is what naturally happens. Any rabbi could have said, Lazarus, come forth and, and within the third day, and if his spirit hadn't fully separated from his body, then it was like, ah, great, but anybody could have done that. But Jesus shows up late on purpose. Because his late arrival to Mary and Martha is really his on-time arrival to show his deity that he is truly the Son of God. Sometimes, sometimes Jesus steps into our situation, not when we want him to, but when he needs to. Because he steps into our situation at the moment when no one can fix it but him so that we can make sure that we don't give glory to ourselves and others, but we give glory to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Some of us are in that fourth day, that fourth day debacle, that fourth day dilemma where our situation feels dead, dead. But can I just tell you, just hold on and wait on him because in the right time, in the due time, in his time, he wants to step into your moment right here and show you that he is always on time. He 
He's always on time. Jesus, he is never, never late. And in this moment, Mary and Martha, they don't believe it. They believe that he missed the mark. And they're angry and they're frustrated with Jesus because they're asking the question, I thought we were close. How is it that you love this man? You were just down the street to Target. You heard we sent word in plenty of time. He was just sick when we sent word to you. But not only did he move, by the time you got here, he moved from being sick to dying to now being in the tomb for four days. And you were just around the corner. And if we're honest with ourselves, many of us, we are, we are angry with God because we believe that he missed the mark. He missed the moment. But can I tell you, he's always on time. It's not only is Jesus never surprised. Not only is he never late. But number three, he always shows compassion. It's the third thing. He always shows compassion. He is a compassionate God. He is, he's not just an all-powerful and an all-knowing God, but he's an all-loving God. When you continue to read on, if you read the whole story, it's a beautiful story. But in verse 33 and 35, when Jesus saw uh, Mary weeping, actually, he says her weeping. When he saw Mary weeping and the Jews who came along her also uh, weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. So now he asked the question, where have you laid him? And he says, come and see. They replied to Jesus. And what did Jesus do? He wept. He wept. Why would Jesus weep when he knows he's about to resurrect? It's because Jesus is always trying to prove a point and teach us moments. See, in, in Psalms 34 and 18, the Bible says that the Lord is close to the broken heart and he saved those who are crushed in spirit. In Romans 12 and 15, the Bible says our God, is he not only knows our pain, but he also feels our pain. He rejoices when we rejoice and he, he, uh, he uh, leads with those who weep. He weeps with those who weep. We serve a God who is not this narcissistic God who kind of is the puppet master, who kind of plays around with our emotions. No, he has the ability to resurrect what is dead, but he also has the ability to be right there in the midst of your moment and hold you while you're hurting and you're weeping. We serve a God who is compassionate, and Jesus shows in this moment before he has this mic drop moment, before he has this da-da moment, he reminds Mary and Martha that, hey, listen, I'm not disconnected. I'm not, I'm not that disconnected to your issue. And many of us feel that way a lot of times that we feel that, man, what I'm going through, man, he's, Jesus is not there. He's, he's disconnected. He doesn't hear my cries. He doesn't hear my pain. He doesn't feel my sadness. And can I just tell you, family, that's not true. Whatever you're going through right now, he doesn't just want to heal you through it and, and walk you through it and deal with you through it, but he also wants to hold you through it. And even when you feel alone, you feel dejected, you feel like everything is coming, crashing in on you, man, can I just tell you, we serve a God who is compassionate. He loves you more than you can ever think or imagine. He cares about you. He, he's right here waiting on you to just, hey, just fall into his, his arms and let him just be there for you. So Jesus, he shows his humanity in the moment that Mary and Martha, they're grieving the most. But here is where it gets good, guys. Not only do Jesus show in this story that he's never surprised, not only does he remind us that he's never late because he had to wait for Lazarus to be dead, dead before he... He does what he needs to do. Not only is he a God who shows compassion, but here is my favorite part of it all. He is a God, Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah. He, number four, he always gets the final word. He always gets the final word. See, in this moment, when we just read the text where he has this very intimate compassionate moment with Mary. And he just does this moment just to show her, hey, I am, yes, the son of God. And I'm right here with you. But then let me remind you just 
of the essence of who I am. So he asked the questions, hey, where'd you lay him? And I don't know what Mary and Martha or the Jews who were around were thinking in this moment. I mean, maybe they just felt like maybe Jesus was feeling guilty that he was laid and he wanted to come and pay his respects. I don't know. But they take Jesus to the tomb. And in verse 26 of chapter 11, before Jesus does his thing, he kind of like just sets the stage of helping us understand the essence of the moment holistically. So what I love about what I'm about to read in verse number 26 is Jesus knew what he was going to say in this verse we're about to read even before the messenger came and brought him the initial word to say that Lazarus was sick. And this is the point that he was trying to prove. He says in verse number 26, he says, the one who believes in me will live. Even though they die, even, and, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? To say, the one who believes in me, listen, before I do what I'm about to do, because it's, it's about to be real dope in this moment. But before I do what I do, I got to ask a question. Do you truly believe that I'm the son of God? Because Lazarus is dead, dead. So I'm about to really show you. But he said, hey, listen, the one who believes in me, you don't really die, you live. You really live. Now, we're all going to have that moment when we physically die, yes. But when we are in Christ Jesus, when we've allowed Jesus to be our Savior and our Lord, Jesus said in this moment, you never die. Why? Because after this life, you get to spend eternity in heaven with my Father. And so he's asking, do you believe? Church asked the question for all of us. Do we truly believe? And while people were contemplating their response, I'm sure people were kind of confused, like, what is Jesus talking about? Here comes the magic moment. So he stands flat-footed at the foot of the tomb. And the Bible says in verse number 43 that Jesus calls out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The reason why this translation used the word loud voice is because it speaks to his authority. That, that word loud voice is, is not that he, he wanted to raise the bass in his voice. He is, to, is showing us that he's showing his, his authority in this moment. I love when Matthew 28, um, 28 tells us in verse 19, it says, all authority uh, Jesus says this, he says, all authority on earth and in heaven is given to me. I got all authority. Why? Because I'm, a, I'm, the, I'm the omni God. I'm the all-knowing, all-powerful, all-loving God. So he speaks with a loud voice. So everyone watching understands that this dude has authority on earth and in heaven. And he says to Lazarus, Lazarus, come out. And everybody's kind of looking, I can imagine, a little bit perplexed. And coming out of the tomb, the shadows of the tomb. It's Lazarus hopping out. Now, his feet are still bound up. His hands are bound up. His face is bound up because bound up, he's, he's a mummy now. Look, he's like a mummy. And he comes out of the tomb just like that. Boom. And everybody around is like, whoa. I can preach this a whole lot of different ways because the the back story of this is that they were so amazed and they knew in this moment, truly, you are the Son of God. And so they went out and they told everybody about it. Why? Because we have been saved to be sent. That's a whole nother topic for another day. But understand this. Sometimes Jesus, not only he steps into your situation when it looks bleak, dark, and dismal, just to show you that I am the Lord your God who healeth thee and I will never leave you nor forsake you. But he also sometimes step into the moment of our situation so that we can be reminded that he is the sovereign God who is in all, who knows all, and can work all things to together of our good. And, and so we can be inspired and compelled to go to the highways and the byways in the four corners of the world and tell people, I know a man. I know a man. But church, here is the truth of the matter, is that as Pastor Luke so eloquently has shared with us over the last few weeks, this idea of dealing with anxiety and overcoming anxiety, I believe that ultimately two things he wants us all to know. Number one, 
Jesus is enough. But then number two is your time to come out. Jesus is speaking to you and he's saying, hey, Jeffrey, come out. Luke, come out. You, come out. Come out of the spirit of depression. Come out of a spirit of anxiety. Come out of a spirit of feeling like you are nothing or you're worthless. Come out and be who God has called you to be. And that's our prayer for you this morning. Will you come out? Come out from the psychological trauma that you're in, the emotional trauma that you're dealing with right now. Will you come out? And yes, there are some things that you need to do within yourself physically and emotionally and practically, yes. But at the end of the day, you need to take your situation, listen to the voice of God, come out and lay it at the feet of Jesus because he is the one who knows. So my prayer as we close our time this morning is that when I say amen and we enter into a time of worship, if there is some in this house who say, man, there's some things that I need to come out of. First and foremost, I need to come out of a life that is absent from living with Jesus. I need to come out and I need to stop living this sinful life. I need to give my life to Jesus. I, want, I know that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior, so I'm going to come out and I'm going to do that. I think there are some of us in this room that we got some things that we're dealing with that's been holding us back and we're still in bondage and we need to come out. And maybe as our worship team leads us in these next few moments, that your way of coming out is that you will stand up, step out, and bring it to the altar. Maybe you'll just kneel here at the altar while we worship God in the spirit of truth because it's your moment and it's your time to come out. Let's pray. God, we thank you for all that our eyes have seen and our ears have heard. We thank you for this moment. We thank you for those who are in this house who need to come out. And God, I pray for a spirit of boldness, that there will be an outpouring of your Holy Spirit, oh God, that will begin to move in this house like never before, and that the people of God will respond to the voice of God, and that they will come out, and that they will experience a freedom like none other. That they will lay their anxieties at the feet of the cross, their depression at the feet of the cross, their insecurities at the feet of the cross, their troubles, their trials, their situations, their hurts, their habits, their hangups. God, that they will lay it at the feet of the cross. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Come on, let's worship God together.